And we're also going to be working with Slido, which we'll introduce in a few slides. Awesome. So I'm going to start off by introducing myself. My name is Jess Magda and I am a solopreneur. I've been in business for over 20 years and I help small businesses and nonprofits, creative service firms, all sorts of different folks with the workflow in their business, their administration and their operations. I also do a lot of leadership training, giving some guidance for small businesses that are scaling up how to get to the next level. I mean, my primary service is helping other people and I enjoy what I do. I'm super pumped to be talking with Daniel and Joseph Studios about uh, restarting and reconnecting with your clients. So Daniel. Thanks Jess. Uh, my name is Daniel Klein. I'm the founder and CEO of Joseph Studios. Uh, we are a organic marketing firm out of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, if you haven't heard of organic, it's, it's building a business relationship with someone else, your audience at scale. So it's focused on human to human connections. It's focused on uh, building this rapport with your audience, with your sales prospects, with past customers, so that you can uh, grow your business in a very meaningful way, in a very holistic way. Um, it's different from general digital marketing in that when you're organic focused, it's not about interruption advertising. It's not about getting in someone's face. It's about helping them solve a problem uh, that's fundamental to whatever use case they have. So um, we love it. We think it's great. Uh, and it's, it's certainly proven beneficial specifically through COVID because of um, the disconnect that we now have where we can't meet in person. Being able to <clears throat> connect with a person digitally is 100% a necessity. So I'm, I'm really grateful to be here with you guys and to talk with y'all and to share some insight. Again, uh, if you have a specific use case in mind, put it in the chat and we'll give you some solutions and outcomes that we think might help you get started here. All right. All right, so the agenda for our conversation is to really rip the Band-Aid off this remote work. We're gonna talk about some best practices and standard operating procedure from working from home and then also some apps that you may know or may not know to consider and get comfortable with that will support you in your new working environment or your existing working environment. Awesome. And then um, I'll take over the reins and we're gonna talk about uh, what to do and how to behave on social media to grow your audience, uh, to get new business going, to kind of re-engage folks. Uh, we're gonna talk some hot tips on email marketing, which is absolutely critical and has an incredible return on investment, specifically for um, retargeting and touch points throughout your sales cycle. We'll cover that in a minute. And then we're also going to be talking about uh, updating or activating your different channels. Sorry, I had a camera blocking the, the text. Uh, so updating and activating your channels. You have different funnels, you have different mechanisms to get leads in place. And so what are the steps in a process oriented way to reactivate those, re-engage all your folks and then get started again? All right, so I think that the big thing about working from home and working in general is that there's no right way to do this. There are so many options and there are so many different considerations that you want to put in front of you when you're deciding on different software, on different targets, on different client bases, on different, you know, there are so many different ways to direct your business, both in business development as well as in operational functioning. And so what we want to say is, is that there is no right way to do things. You're doing the things that you need to do in the best way possible for you, but using the tools that are available to you does make things easier and more streamlined. So one of the things that we want to make sure you know is that there are resources available to you that you should leverage to facilitate and give you space to do what you really want to do, whether that be develop your business or create something or you know build relationships but you don't have to do it alone so one of the things um, if we could pop forward Catherine is we're going to be using in this conversation an app called Slido and if you guys go to your mobile phones and go to your browser um, and go type in slido sli.do It'll pop up and you can type in the event 69762. 
What this is going to allow us to do is have some fun with some real time live interaction polling about our conversation. So it's sli.do. You can also do it on your computer in a web browser, but we like to have you focusing as fully as possible on us. Um, so try not to get sidetracked. And uh, I think that then once you all have that up, what we can do is pop over to the next slide. And what we wanna do is ask you, has your adjustment to remote work been hard or surprisingly seamless? So then in Slido, if you go to the next slide again, Catherine, you'll see these questions. And if you could all answer, what we can do is we'll see what everyone thinks about working from home. And I always enjoy using Slido because it is a real live interaction. And I'm voting as well. I've chosen somewhere in between because it's, it's nice to, to be able to work and it's 12 steps away. However, every once in a while the kids will just burst in. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Um, so I think that, you know, we have a couple of people saying that it's interesting. It's somewhere in between. It's interesting to me is that most people don't think it's been incredibly hard. And I think that that's great. I think there's also sort of an interaction, a thought about the fact that we're living in a new world where this wasn't such a big leap for many of us to actually be working from home, right? So why don't we pop in to the next slide, Catherine? And if you guys wanna have any comments, feel free to drop into the chat. But what I wanna talk about first, in terms of this working from home best practices, is the idea of communication. So whether we're at home or we're in person, face-to-face, -face, communication is one of the bedrock points of working. You don't work in a vacuum. You're working for clients at a very basic level. So what I broke this down into is, is there are a couple of different um, sections of communication. One is internal communications, and this is talking about the structure of your organization. So depending upon how many people you work with, having internal communications separated from external communications is really helpful because it helps you prioritize and understand when different people are talking to you on a real base level. You know, if your colleague is talking to you and you're on Slack and then you get an email from, you know, legal counsel about, a pending issue, you're gonna to wanna to be able to attend to that, attending most important issue as opposed to just chatting with your colleague. So a lot of people are really using Slack in a great way um, and they can use it, especially when you're working remotely. And I know that Daniel's organization is fully remote as is Mac to Works. Having that relationship with all of your staff as you scale up is a challenge when you're apart and having a, a regular stand up, which is something that works really well in person, is possible via Slack. There are uh, some great apps that collaborate with Slack, Geekbot. You can do your daily tasks in a stand up. You can also have different things like Kudos or Tacos, where you're acknowledging your different colleagues. And you can set up different channels to sort of organize your communications. For email, everyone has their own email provider, but having a separation of professional email and personal email, internal email, external email is really helpful for prioritizing and understanding what you need to respond to and when. And having a set understanding of when you should reply to emails. You don't need to reply to emails immediately. One of the strongest things I can tell you is to set aside a time for responding to things so that you have time for creation and focusing on, on your client work, as opposed to continually checking emails throughout the day. Um, and if you're nervous about that, you can always talk, put a uh, footer in your email response saying, 
I respond to emails between four and six each evening. Please be patient. If you have an emergency, please call, something like that. For the big thing of, that's changed with remote working is the visual connection. So instead of being in person, we're now all, as we are here, on video. This really should be between two or more people. Obviously, having a video with yourself, not that helpful, unless you're, you know, using it as a mirror. But you want to have that connection, that eye-to-eye -eye connection. You want to see if people are looking, if they're focusing on you. Having your screen on in a video call is really valuable. It shows that you respect the other person's time, unless of course there's something going on in your background that you don't want to distract the rest of the call with. Um, and then finally, in terms of another communication best practice is dealing with your files. So dealing with servers. There are a lot of uh, web-based servers right now, and they're a great solution because they allow you to collaborate both um, you could do it through Google, you could do it through Box, you could do it through Dropbox, and they're all developing these collaboration tools that allow you to not only not overload your computer and its central processing unit, but also allow you to work in real time. So there are some real basic um, best practices for communicating as you collaborate. Um, then if we want to pop towards the next slide, thank you. Another thing to consider is security. So this was an issue before, but now with everyone working from home, especially if you're in a, a larger, however you want to define that organization, as opposed to being a solopreneur, you want to you want to consider using a password tool for all of your passwords. This is a great solution, actually, for personal and work, since we have so many different. Everything requires logins. You don't want to have to have the same login for multiple tools. And so, what you want to do is have those passwords as secure as possible. And the best way to do that is a password tool like One Password or um, there's another one, there are a couple of them out there. Two-factor authentication is a really great new-ish way to ensure that you're being as secure as possible in that a lot of different apps are now offering it. It's been around for a long time, but it's a smart way to keep your data secure. Um, anyone should have a secure password on your machine even if it's just to uh, keep prying greasy little fingers out of your work. I don't know anything about that. And uh, VPN, a uh, virtual private network, is a really, it's their apps that allow you basically to mask your information um, at, in, on a public line. So that's a real basic way to say it. I mean, Daniel comes from security, so he might say that explaining it differently than I do, which uh, we can chat about next. But I think that the, that's really an important issue is security to consider. So if we could pop forward to the next slide, please. I think that this is a really great thing to consider. So John Seely Brown, was a director at Xerox, and he said, the way forward is paradoxically not to look ahead, but to look around. I know you're not supposed to read the quotes, but it's really important to say it because there are so many resources available to you, especially now in this time when we're all at home and we're all glued to our screens and we're looking at webinars and we're collaborating with our colleagues and we're still trying to develop new business and we're maybe trying to have new workflows put in place, you don't have to reinvent the wheel because people have already done that and it just takes a little bit of leveraging all of your assets, your human assets, to see what you can use as a solution. So if we can go to the next slide, thanks. Um, so that this leads me to, uh, my final slide, which is about project management. 
And I think that one of the things that's really important is to talk about the different tools that are available. So project management is a real basic concept. And I know that a lot of people are so busy running their business that it's hard to keep everything fully organized. And that's completely normal. But what you want to know is, is that there is software available to keep your projects on schedule, to track your deliverables and your timelines. And a lot of these are free or at very low cost, you know, and then there are ones that are at enterprise pricing. But Trello, Airtable, Monday are all great sort of small business solutions. Mural or its Google alternative is, are really great for remote workshops and brainstorming sessions where you can actually collaborate. Doodle is a free uh, scheduling software. Now as we work remotely, it's really hard to set aside time for meetings because everyone is having a lot of meetings back to back to back. So if you have a large group, it's really a great way to be able to figure out a time that works for everyone. And then there are also ways to collect feedback from your clients or even your staff, Google Form, SurveyMonkey type form. And then on the other side of closing the deal and making sure that everything is tidy, you have things like DocuSign that give you, and Adobe has a new signing uh, extension to, to their software that allows you to really be sure that all your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed. So these collaboration tools allow you to brainstorm, to get things in your book, and you know to really make sure that everything is lined up. So project management is on a certain way, something that you have maybe a little more space to put your mind to in this new remote normal. So now if we could pop to the next slide, um, what I'd like to do is open this up to a little bit of discussion. And in Slido, if you guys could all put in or add your top tools that you plan to use or already use to engage with your clients. So Catherine, if you pop to the next slide and everyone pops over to Slido, you'll see that you can put in this live poll things that you already use with your clients and you can do multiple things. So if everyone could put in a couple of uh, apps that they really like to use, then we can see and share what different people think is valuable to using with their clients. And I'm gonna do it too. Oh, wow. Whipster video review, very amazing. Basecamp is a great project management tool. So interestingly, oh, Slack is coming up as a, as a something that a lot of people are using. So having a word cloud like this is really interesting because you can see things that, that are more popular than other things. And it is, you know, Dropbox, Harvest, Google Docs, Slack. It's great. Um, so does anyone have any questions they want to jump in specifically before we talk a little bit more about like the marketing side of things? You can just pop your uh, question into the chat. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? No? All right. That's okay. Freaking Daniel. Good. Yeah. Daniel, take it away. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. That was cool. Whipster. I've never heard of that, but I'm definitely going to take a look. That's pretty cool stuff. Um, all right, guys. So as, as I kind of go through this, I really want this to be personalized for you. Um, so with that being said, if you have an example or an industry that you specifically work in and you want me to talk about that more so than what I'm jib jabbing on, put it in the chat section below. Um, so for example, uh, email marketing, there, there is an, ah, man, I can't really recommend email marketing enough. There's a huge ROI on email marketing and it's because 
as we go through uh, sales funnels, as we um, work with clients, future, past, whatever, uh, we need to reach out to them multiple times. So retargeting from an ad perspective is a thing because we get busy, we need other things, um, and then we come back to it. So uh, it's not that I don't wanna work with somebody, it's not that they don't wanna work with me, it's that the timing wasn't right, but having a retargeting campaign from an ad perspective is a great way to just stay top of mind. From the organic side of things, email marketing is a great way to stay top of mind with folks. So whether you have an e-commerce, uh, there's so many e-commerce stores out there that don't retarget or have a follow-up email campaign a week after a product's been shipped to say, hey, did you get the product? Is everything okay? Do you need anything from me? And that would be huge to building a relationship. Or um, same example, e-commerce again, uh, you should absolutely have a follow-up built into your process uh, at some point to either cross-sell, upsell, or do something else. Um, so if your product is up in 30 days, maybe you have a, a CBD tincture or you have some creative product that you send to somebody, uh, about probably 80%, 75% of the way through that product's life cycle, you need to send a follow-up email, letting them know, hey, I'm here, and if you would like more, let me know. Here's a sample or here's a 5% off or something else. But email is huge for this stuff and it's awesome. Um, let's see, to me, I see that you are coming from the creative industry. So I'll, I'll have a couple examples for you from the creative industry. If that's graphic design, let me know. If that's um, some sort of a, a craft or trades, trades personship, uh, let me know that as well. And so I'll tailor that a little bit. But all that to say this, uh, building and developing your email list is step one. And it's for a lot of folks, graphic design, thank you. Um, so from a graphic design perspective, having an email list is huge to getting reoccurring gigs. Uh, a lot of graphic design is uh, a one and done kind of gig, or maybe it's a uh, having someone on retainer for 500 or 1,000 bucks a month, that kind of thing. But to build an email list is step one, and how you go about doing that is pretty straightforward. You already have an email list, maybe you don't realize it. Uh, in your Outlook, in your G Suite, um, you have emails that you've been sending to past customers, current customers, friends of friends, partners, and pulling the emails from your own email uh, tool is step one to building a really awesome uh, database of emails. So if you were to go into G Suite or Outlook, um, you probably already have a bunch of prospects from a couple months ago that you should be following up with. You probably have some past clients that might need another hand as they uh, roll into the fall, and that might be a really great way to start an email list. Alternatively, you're talking to folks on Facebook, I hope, Instagram, definitely, and LinkedIn, most likely, and reaching out to them, building your email list from the contacts. Uh, there's still a way to do that within LinkedIn. Um, reaching out to them one-on-one -on -one with a DM saying, hey, I'd love to follow up with you. I push out uh, some valuable content once a week, valuable content once every other month. If you'd like to be added to this mailing list, just send me your information and I'll add you. If you ever wanna opt out, that's cool too. But that initial outreach is gonna really help you in building a list so that you don't have to continuously follow up with every single person all the time. And that's really what we're focusing on is doing this at scale. So take your list, um, segment your list by the type of persona that you're gonna be working with. So that might be past customers, future customers, a specific type of use case that you helped them with. And the graphic design perspectives, that'd be like uh, logos, banners, branding versus advertising and artistic work um, or something else, something unique. Um, try and segment out your group based on what you worked with them on or when you worked with them and then send them custom emails uh, once a month, once every other week that says, hey, here's what I'm doing in this sector. Here's how I think of this item or topic, or I read this blog. Here's what you, I thought about it. Let me know what you think as well. These are important because it puts you in a thought leadership position. It puts you in a position where you're top of mind um, and it reaches them in a very impactful way. So on top of this, building these personas out will help you reach your audience in a more profound way. If I were to send an email blast across the entire world and to say, my name's Daniel Klein, I run Joseph Studios, that's not really gonna amount to much. Um, but if I were to send a more targeted message, like uh, we represent this type of company, they had a specific problem, we address this problem in these three ways. And I only sent that message to similar companies or similar people in companies with a similar problem, it's gonna resonate more. They're gonna get more out of it, which means they're gonna be engaged, they're gonna click through stuff, they're gonna show up to the website, they're gonna fall out of that funnel at the bottom end for, for the sales team to pick up. And that's a beautiful thing. 
Um, so send tailored messages to each persona, focus on really understanding that person, that persona, what makes them tick, what they want said to them, how they want it said. All of those things are really critical. No one likes a generic email blast getting sent to them, but they all appreciate that handwritten letter kind of approach. And that's what we're aiming for here. Okay. So lastly, build content for each persona that's valuable. So again, from the graphic design perspective, if you helped them with branding, maybe six months ago, it might be time and it's the first time they did a logo and we all know how crazy that can get. Um, it might be good to focus on follow-ups for them. Maybe they just did one logo, but in reality, you know, they really need three or four, maybe like a big one that could go across a whole banner, maybe a smaller version for a header, maybe an even smaller version for a business card, and then like a single image, like a single little object just to put in like corners of stuff or as an icon or a flavicon or something like that. And so re-engaging them with a campaign like that to say, hey, I hope business has been great over the last six months. Um, I think your time to, it's time for you to level up. Right, here's how I would level you up. Uh, if you'd like to talk, let me know. And then you suggest an outcome like that. So you're being solutions focused, you're targeting a specific user based on past experience that you know about. You can send that message to everyone that you did business with between six and nine months ago. That might be a thing. Um, so focus on your email campaign and not just sending emails, but why you send emails, what solutions you provide, and then targeting specific messaging for each type of person. So. That's what I think of email marketing, but again, huge ROI. It's, it's, it's incredible. Each person's going to take like five to seven follow-ups before they fall out of your funnel. Email is a really great way to do that. All right, uh, Catherine, let's hop on the next slide. Social media. So some thoughts on social media. Oh, thank you to me. I appreciate that. Um, so from a social media aspect, social media is such an incredible way to build a, a relationship with somebody at scale. Again, whole thing of this is at scale. Um, social media is really important uh, in that we're not able to go to conferences or conventions or happy hours. I'm personally looking for a way to send my sales prospects a little vial of whiskey or a can of beer or something so that we can still have that happy hour thing going on. I think that'd be a great lead in. Uh, send them, you know, they get a little package in the mail from Joseph Studios. They open it up and it's a whiskey and said, this is for our sales meeting at five o'clock today. See you at the happy hour. I think that'd be great. Um, but I'm trying to build a relationship with someone at scale across a digital landscape. Social media is an incredible way to do that. Um, here's how I would go about doing that, uh, whether I was a small, medium or large business. So I would first, I would explain what happened uh, for you specifically when COVID hit. COVID's the big thing for this year. So I would explain like what happened to you in 2020, um, whether or not it was a complete shutdown or a partial shutdown, or you're still kind of in the mix, explain what the heck happened. And the goal here is to humanize your brand. And I know it sounds silly, but so many entrepreneurs when they first start off will use the, the pronoun we, we this, are that, we want to, blah, blah, blah. Like, dude, it's you. I know it's just you. You bought a polo shirt off of Etsy or something. I know it's you, but come on, chill out. And what's funny about that is the largest brands in the world, the Deltas, the Home Depots, the AT&Ts, the Chick-fil-A's, they're trying to humanize their brand. They're trying to step out from behind that logo and be a real person. And some people like it. Some people are like, why are these people in my business? But it's an important thing to do for this reason. When a client has a problem, they don't want a logo to pick up the phone. They want a person to pick up the phone. They want you to pick up the phone. And you need to have that relationship with them so that they know there is someone there to help catch their fall if they trip. And that's a key thing to selling and getting new business is helping them understand that when something goes wrong, you will be there to support them. So that comes with humanizing your brand and stepping out from behind the logo. For example, if you have trouble with a ticket or a plane or something goes wrong and you're a Delta Airlines customer, hit them up, DM them on Facebook, DM them on Twitter or Instagram. And I guarantee stinking to you, because I know the team, I guarantee stinking to you that they will reply uh, and they'll use their name in the reply. And they're not gonna say, thank you very much, Delta Airlines. No, oh. they're gonna say, thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you very much, Melissa. Because they're trying to humanize themselves. They're trying to step out from behind that logo. And that's super, super important. So do that, tell the story of what the heck happened. Tell the story of how you're going to restart because it's not just about being human, but it's going through a journey with another human. And it's that hero's journey that you partner with your clients for, you're a part of their success. This is opening yourself up so that they can be a part of your success, which is a cool little twist. 
So I would tell the story of what the heck happened. I would tell the story of what we're doing to restart, what a day in the life of the shop is like, or what a day in the life of the office is like in COVID. Um, I would tell these stories of what it's like to unlock the door and flip on the switch for the first time, what it's like to reprep the kitchen for first service, what it's like to, uh, if you have a fish store, what it's like to get the first batch of new fish in from wherever. Um, if you have a lawn care maintenance company, what it's like to mow the first lawn of the summer after the shutdown and have that experience with a customer again. Or, and we were working with some really great HVAC and plumbers, what it's like to do a FaceTime consultation with a potential customer. So if you're a plumber or an HVAC person or something out, you can still operate uh, in a shutdown. It's just that you need a way to have a FaceTime event so that you can see the issue. You can advise on the issue. Okay, we'll have a guy out. Don't worry, he's gonna have his mask and his gloves, but we got you. This is gonna be something we can help with. That's a great way to build a relationship. It really is. Um, and it's a great way to have people be a part of your, your story. So uh, also a part of this, celebrate the victories intentionally because defeats celebrate themselves. When something goes wrong, everyone knows about it. It blows up. It's terrible. Uh, it doesn't need to be celebrated anymore. But when something goes right, people usually have that expectation. It's like, good, this should have happened. Let's move on. And that sucks, right? That's not fun. So celebrate the victories on social media, call it out. We just opened our doors for the first time in a month and a half. We just hired our first person post COVID, right? We just, we broke our milestone, right? We were hoping to get 5,000 this month. We were hoping to get 20,000 this month in revenue. We broke it by 15%. And that's because of you and y'all's community and y'all helped us out and we are so thankful. Thank you. Come see us this Saturday, right? Something like that, I don't know. Um, but celebrate the victories. Uh, there's another great quote in here um, so Napoleon was running across Europe, right? At some point in the past and, uh, I'm not a history buff, rolling across Europe at some point in the past, his lieutenants were drunks as all lieutenants are. And if you're not in the military, it's okay. But if you were, I hope you laugh. Um, so the lieutenants had a saying and that said, uh, um, champagne in defeat, you need it. And in victory, you want it. So I think they're just drinking all the time. And I would highly recommend that you celebrate your victories on social media every single time they happen. Like call those suckers out because you deserve it. Um, share customer successes, right? We went to this person's house. We hooked them up with a new HVAC, a new filter system, um, a new lawn. Uh, I helped out. So going back to graphic design, I helped a company restart. I helped a company rebrand. I helped my first entrepreneur of the year, or I helped my 10th entrepreneur of the year start a new business because entrepreneurs see this as an opportunity to grow. And when this hit, I had three people call me up and be like, now's the time to make a move. I'm gonna head it up with this, that, or the other. Cool, yeah, that's a great approach. It's a great time to buy stuff. It's a great time to invest in a business. Uh, we're in a trough right now. And so the millionaires aren't made in like the 2016s, 2017s. They're made in the 2008s or in the 2020s. So I would highly recommend that, that uh, you celebrate the victories of your customers, okay? And then build a community. So, so much of what we do, and we're gonna hit on this in the next slide, so much of what we do is world building, right? It's not just about buying a HVAC or a logo or um, a lawn mowing service. It's about what the lifestyle of living in that world is like. So what's the lifestyle of someone who has a maid service come to their house once a week? And what is that to them personally? Tell that story. That's a cool story. That's gonna help you get a lot of conversions because if you don't have to worry about someone cleaning your house and you have so fewer worries, you can have so much more time for family and events and other stuff. You never have to have this worry or dread over your house that everything's a mess. That's a great story to tell. Or if you have a graphic designer who can just uh, make everything kind of happen for you so you don't have to worry about creatives or social posts, that's amazing too. All right, let's hop to the next slide. Yep, more on worldview or world building. So um, what I would recommend, I'm gonna pop this over there. So what I would recommend is update your website. So always be updating your website, always be adding additional content, having additional posts, having a presence. You're trying to do two things. The first thing you're trying to do is show Google, and I know it's crazy, show Google that you're growing and strong and you're, you're a part of something bigger. They will pick up on that. You will rank better. You'll get more results, more traffic, more customers. 
always be changing your website just a little bit, adding stuff to it. Also, same thing, and this is with social and email and everything else marketing, you want to show that you're growing and strong and powerful because people want to partner with brands that are strong and powerful and growing. They don't want to partner with someone that might blow up next week um, because if you don't complete the project and they sunk money into you, that sucks. So always focus on growing and showing strength and um, building towards something greater, even if it starts at a point of we just open the front door. If you just open the front door, but we have a plan and we're going to make this happen, come visit us. That's perfectly fine too. All right. Uh, and then lastly, and kind of summarizing everything, consider this as an opportunity. Again, millionaires were made in 2008. Millionaires are going to be made in 2020. Have a millionaire mindset. And that is have a positive attitude, be solutions focused, and focus on goals. And then if worse comes down to it and you have a terrible day, go to sleep, forget about everything that happened, wake up, and go charging into tomorrow just with as much fervor as you've always charged into it. Rinse and repeat for 10 years and you're gonna be successful. It's not an easy path, but that's the winner's mindset. Always focus on goals, always focus on strategy, make it happen, be positive, don't focus on the negative, and you'll be just fine. All right, next slide. Heck yeah, okay, so how can we help? So we're Joseph Studios, we do organic marketing. Everything I talked about today, we can help with, um, and a lot more. So if you check us out on josephstudios.net, that's probably the best place to learn a little bit more about us. We're also on Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram and YouTube. So you name it, we're out there. Uh, some of the benefits of working with us, short-term contracts, because we want to have a partnership with you just as much as you with us, and we want it to work. Uh, we're metrics-driven. We are very focused on process, very focused on results, and it's a white glove service through and through. So having someone on the team that knows you, cares about you, answers the phone, all that's included. All right. And so for me, that was great, Daniel. Um, I am an entrepreneur, a solopreneur, and a one-person shop. You can reach out to me on jess at macdorks.com. You can check out my website. And I provide solutions from the ground up as a person who does consultations. I help with all of the potholes in the road to smooth them so that you can move forward more easily and more gracefully and more speedily to your goals. And I appreciate having this opportunity to talk with y'all. We have actually on the next slide, a uh, two question survey. And if you choose to answer it, um, Catherine, can you pop forward? Yep. If you answer in the Zoom chat here with your email, you will be entered into a drawing and the chances of winning are really good. A chance to win a half hour consultation with myself and a half hour concert consultation of personalized marketing with Joseph Studios. So the two questions are, what's your biggest hurdle in working remotely? And what's your one key takeaway from the presentation with your email? So that'll take a minute to uh, answer. But what I'd like to do now is while people are answering, we can also open up to any questions that you might have. So once again, uh, Catherine, if you could put the, the two questions into the chat so people can yep. see them. What's your biggest hurdle in working remotely? And what's your one key takeaway from the presentation? That would be great to know, especially as we you know, move forward and collaborate together as Joseph Studios and Mac to Work, should we decide to have a follow-up conversation with any of y'all or with other people? Um, so Timia says, face-to-face -face collaboration brainstorming. I think that is always tough. Yeah, and face-to-face -face brainstorming or remote brainstorming, I think is a real challenge. I think that uh, for me, Daniel, maybe I'll answer and then you can add in. Mm -hmm. um, you have to set the stage and that is have some really good framing questions that are gonna lead you to a goal. Have some tools that inspire, I think particularly Timia for creatives. You know, if you have like different colored post-its and different colored Sharpies, crayons, what I would do with a client 
similar to Daniel sending a uh, airplane bottle of whiskey, if I was doing a brainstorming remotely with a client, I would send a box of like supplies, post-it notes, you know, that uh, washi tape, crayons, colored markers. So then you could work collaboratively and uh, you know, a lot of creatives are really tactile. So they wanna be able to draw as opposed to like writing in a shared Google Doc or or on a whiteboard. So I think that that's a, that's a really big challenge, but collaborative brainstorming is all about leading the brainstorm. So as the leader of the brainstorm, you have to know where you wanna go and try and back out questions that are gonna get you there. What do you say, Daniel? Agree with all that. Um, there's a couple techniques that are used in software development because so many software developers are not co-located. So there's a lot of really great best practices from the last 20 years as far as how do you collaborate with someone who's like eight time zones away. Um, I would recommend that you check out and do some research on two concepts. The first is called uh, time boxing and it's really great for a timed meeting as well. So you can say, um, all right, folks, for the next five minutes, all we're going to do is list out all the different things that are special to us as far as our brand or that come to mind when we think of our brand and then have a shared Google Doc or you can have uh, your in-person creative materials or you can just share a whiteboard and just shout it out or whatever else. And so when the five minutes is up, the five minutes is up and you move on or the whole group has to vote to add another two minutes or something like that. And then you can keep focused, you can keep uh, a conversation moving forward while still being creative because you don't want people to be so creative that they lose track of time. And the next key thing I would recommend is something called mind mapping, where for like the next five minutes, we're gonna talk about everything that comes to mind with this, or what are the key features that we want as far as our new brands or our new logos, or what do we think of when we think of these three colors versus the other three colors. Um, so I would focus on mind mapping as a great technique. I would focus on um, from a problem resolution technique. There's a great thing out there called, and now that I'm trying to think of it, I won't be able to, um, Pareto diagrams. So Pareto diagrams are a great way to understand the top three issues because usually you'll find that like 20% of the issues cause 80% of the problems. And so Pareto diagrams are an awesome way to identify that. So if you're looking for a way, again, for graphic design, you're looking for a way to um, call out issues so that you don't have rework on the back end. Like, what do you think of, what do you think's wrong with this, uh, this logo, right? And then list out all the problems that you think are wrong with the logo. You're going to have a lot less rework on the back end because people aren't going to say, well, I didn't think of that or blah, blah, blah. So it'll help facilitate a discussion. Networking, new business, business developing, relationship development. Um, and all this is coming from Ashton. Uh, so Jess, would you like to take a crack at uh, Ashton's question of networking and new business development while online only? Would you like me to? You want to start back and forth? Sure. Uh, why don't we do back and forth and then that'll be the last question. Sam, I'm sorry we didn't get to yours, but we will, uh, we'll, we'll circle back with you for sure. But um, so the big challenge, the big hurdle of networking remotely, new business development. Um, well, there are two questions in here. There's networking, new business development and orientation in terms of culture. So those are two really very separate issues. Developing a workplace culture remotely, uh, to take the, the easier one, is all about communication. And it's really all about regular communication, video communication, and leadership. So not only leadership from the top down, but leadership of bringing the, the staffer or staffers on board within the culture by getting to know them as well as clearly managing their expectations for their their new role. Um, Daniel, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Sure, so Sam and Ashton, I'm gonna try and um, group your two questions together because I see closing sales leads and I see networking. And so I see top of the funnel work and I see bottom of the funnel work. Um, and so, here, here's an approach that I would suggest for you both that I think will help uh, you both out because uh, again, it's about relationship building. So if you have a really strong relationship quickly, uh, you'll be more likely to close deals quickly. That's my assumption. So there's, there's a concept and again, a lot of the techniques that Joseph Studios uses comes from the intelligence community. So that's what I'm about to jib jab about right here. Um, 
there's a thing that's outside of a sales conversation called an informational interview. And you're trying to ask questions that have implications that then have results that could include your service or good. Um, what I want you to focus on is a specific niche, a specific type of uh, customer. And maybe it could be an industry, maybe it could be a use case. Focus on that and then I want you to do interviews with at least 10, usually 10 is a good number, 10 people in that industry, but not from the sales aspect. So for example, um, and if you post some examples in here, then I could better tailor it. Uh, so let's say for example, you are a consultant, a business consultant, and you focus on the fashion industry. I would want you to interview um, people within fashion companies uh, or labels who do sourcing, who basically could help you out uh, as you went through a project with your company. I would interview them for things like, what are some of the problems you're having? How have you overcome them? And what solutions are you looking for when trying to overcome those problems? I'm making this up as I go. But you'll find that probably between interview seven, interview nine, you'll notice a lot of patterns emerging and what they're saying. And as you go through the next round of informational interviews, you'll be able to suggest things rather than them suggest things. So it's like, I've noticed that most people in the fashion industry this year are trying to solve this problem with this solution, but they're having these outcomes that aren't the greatest in here and here. How have you addressed this problem or would you consider this other solution? And that's gonna really make them think. They're gonna look at that and go, holy cow, who is this person? How, how do they know this stuff? They really know their stuff. Now, from the sales aspect to help close those types of relationships, um, you can have um, aspirational case studies where it's not necessarily something that you've done in the past, but something that you would do or something that you could achieve in a similar way or how other people have done it. And I would present that as part of a proposal. That would definitely help you close more stuff. Uh, and then as far as networking and having additional opportunities, getting out there on the dance floor that is LinkedIn and connecting with people, having meaningful conversations, uh, caring about their, their outcomes and legitimately trying to start something. That's, that's a great way to network. There's a lot of people doing cold outreach on LinkedIn right now, but if you make it personable, if you actually try and have a relationship with the person that benefits them and you focus on that more so than what can I sell them, I think you'll have a lot better success. I hope that was helpful. Awesome. So, uh, Catherine, do you want to close us out here? Yeah. So if everyone can just send their emails in the chat, just so we can enter you into the drawing, that would be great. Um, but thank you so much for joining us for the webinar today. I just sent Daniel's and Jess's emails so we can keep in contact after this. And, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, we awesome. really enjoyed it. Bye guys. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.